Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Please visit audiblepodcast.com slash gems for your free audiobook download. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 123. Okay, we've talked in previous episodes about terms of endearment for grandmas and grandpas. And so many of you have shared your wonderful stories of what you called your grandparents and what your grandkids are calling you. And as I told you, I've been encouraging my almost two-year-old grandson, Davey, to call me grandma, like I used to call my wonderful grandma, Burkett. But of course, I'm just excited to have him have a name for me. Well, folks, I think we have it. Davy has christened me. Shasha. Yep, I am Shasha. And what do I think? I love it. How many Shashas are out there? Not sure how we got to Shasha from Grandma, but it is music to my ears. And he's calling his aunt, my daughter Lacey, Cece. And it was so funny the other day because he was at our house and I put him down for a nap. And after I went back downstairs, I could hear him upstairs just chattering away. And he's saying, Shasha this and Cece that. And he had this whole little story going on. So we have one more name for grandma and that's Shasha. And I am proud to be a Shasha. So of course, that got me wondering if Shasha means anything else. So I sort of did a quick Google search. And did you know that there is an urban dictionary? Yep, according to the urbandictionary.com, a shasha is a soft, tender, romantic girl, utterly beautiful, artistically sound. And to use it in a sentence, her art spoke with confidence and might as though it had been created by Shasha herself. <laughs> and wait, there's another definition. A dreamy blonde woman whose tenuous relationship with reality enables her to exist as a drifting cloud, floating along in a nebulous manner, not quite sold and always slightly vague. Hmm. I don't know, but that sort of sounds like uh, urban code for dumb blonde. Anyway, <laughs> this Shasha has been busily working to finish making Davy's birthday present since his big birthday number two is coming up on December 15th. Now, in Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 119, I told you how I decided to make Davy a Blue's Clues card table playhouse. Now, you remember throwing a blanket over a card table when you were a kid um, to make it into a playhouse, right? On a rainy day? Well, this one was a bit challenging because there's no pattern for a Blue's Clues playhouse out there. So I just made it up as I went along. But thanks to uh, Google Image Search and my trusty iPad, I was able to come up with something that looks pretty close to the real deal. So all you moms and shashas out there, if you are interested, be sure and check out the show notes for this episode, which is 123. And you're going to see a couple of snapshots of the playhouse. And it doesn't just look like Blue's Clues house from the outside, but I lined the panels with fabric on the inside so that it looks like the wallpaper in her house. And I even sewed in some features in felt like um, the famous table and telephone and uh, the framed picture of the felt people on the wall. So <laughs> I had a ton of fun doing it. I hope he enjoys it as much as I did making it. You know, to me, what we are doing today with our kids and our grandkids, and in some cases, our great grandkids, is just as important as researching our family history. In fact, I'd say it's more important. Creating memories with our loved ones is creating family history right now. And to me, there's nothing more important than that. But after I did my Shaw Shaw thing, uh, I did get around to find out what's going on in the genealogy world. And I do have some news for you. First of all, as all of you Genealogy Gems Premium members know, on the Premium Podcast lately, we've been covering how to use the iPad and other tablets out there in the marketplace for our family history. Well, Ancestry just announced that it has updated the Ancestry app. 
Ancestry.com has a popular app that lets you take your Ancestry.com family tree with you on your iPad or your iPhone. And the newest version of the app now includes the shaky leaf hints that you see also on their website. Plus, there is a simple merge tool that helps you quickly add new relatives and information to your family tree, automatically adds information to photos, allows you to change your tree privacy settings, adds an integrated user feedback support feature, and is faster and more stable than the previous versions. Now, do you wonder sometimes how they can afford to make the app free? Well, they have started introducing in-app purchases, which I'm seeing more and more of out there. Their new in-app purchase option gives you access to historical records. And you might be wondering, well, why would I use the app rather than just use the browser on my tablet to visit their website? Well, that's a good point. I did some test driving of the app, and I didn't see the in-app purchases come up. And I'm guessing, of course, that's because I was signed into my account. So I think the idea here is that they are providing a viable option for somebody who doesn't have an Ancestry account um, to see these historical records come up in small bits and pieces that they can purchase in small chunks, which, of course, they hope will lead them to getting a subscription purchase. So if you already have an account and you sign into it in your app, um, you may not see the in-app purchases if it's things that you already have access to. Also, of course, the shaky leaves are only going to show up on your tree. I was looking because I had several trees pop up um, that I'm a member of, if you will. But um, I only manage one or two of them. And the shaky leaves, of course, just show up on the ones that you manage. So um, it's interesting. You don't, it's certainly a long way from the full robust features of the Ancestry.com website. But if you have your family tree on the Ancestry site, this is all about the family tree. You might want to take a look at the app and possibly uh, getting that new version of their app. Also new in iTunes are some new podcasts by the National Archives Records Administration here in the U.S. They have recently announced that they have added some new podcasts to iTunes U, which is sort of a special section of the iTunes store. It's devoted to higher education. Mostly those podcasts are from universities. The first one that they added is the Civil War podcast, which explores some of the most important documents pertaining to the Civil War. And they have also added the World War II in the News video podcast, which features World War II newsreel, which are always kind of interesting. I'll have links for you in the show notes, of course, for both of those. There's been an update to the system that uh, NARA uses for the Freedom of Information Act requests that they get. Um, I blogged about that on the Genealogy Gems news blog, so I'll have a link in the show notes to take you over to that to check that out. And um, there's some new imagery on Google Earth. Recently, the folks at Google have uploaded some new high-resolution aerial images to U.S. cities, and they include Bellingham, Washington, Brookings, South Dakota, Davenport, Iowa, Emporia, Kansas, Grinnell, Iowa, Idaho Falls, Idaho, Klamath Falls, Oregon, beautiful place, Lawrence, Kansas, Lovell, Wyoming, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, Peninsula, California, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, Seattle, Washington, St. Louis, Missouri, Terre Haute, Indiana, Waco. Oregon, Williston, North Dakota, and Wolf Point, Montana. So if you're researching any of those areas, um, looking for ancestors, you might get a better look at those locations now in Google Earth. And FindMyPast.ie has recently announced that they have launched exclusive access to the Irish prison registers, 1790 to 1920. The collection is made up of over 3.5 million entries across 130,000 pages. Now, this is from their press release. It says the original prison registers held at the National Archives of Ireland cover all types of custodial institutions from bridewells to county prisons to sanatoriums for alcoholics. They contain over three and a half million entries spread over 130,000 pages with most records giving comprehensive details of the prisoner, including name, address, place of birth, occupation, religion, education, age, physical description, name and address of the next of kin, crime committed, sentences, dates of committal, and release and deceased dates. They present evidence of a society of rebellion and social confrontation, where rioting and assault of police officers were everyday occurrences, and of rampant poverty and destitution, with the theft of everything from handkerchiefs to turnips. 
So if you have some wayward Irish ancestors, you might want to give that a try. And next up, the Library and Archives Canada has launched a new blog. It's a project developed by the Resource Discovery Sector, monitored and answered by multidisciplinary teams. The Library and Archives Canada blog plans to provide some useful tips and recommend tools to help you discover your documentary heritage and navigate the LAC website. Now, this is a four-month pilot project. It's just one of a number of modernization initiatives that focuses on providing their patrons with quick and easy access to the LAC collection. The blog also connects you with LAC and other people who share an interest in Canadian history. So you'll find the new Library and Archives blog at thediscoverblog.com. And you can contact them at blog at bac lac gc.ca. And I have a few new things going on around here to tell you about. Um, first, I'm very excited to tell you that my book, The Genealogist's Google Toolbox, was featured in the most recent issue of Shelf Unbound magazine. I'll have a link to it in the show notes for you. And a big thank you to all of you who've bought the book, because I think those purchases really helped bring the book to the attention of a non-genealogy publication. So that was kind of cool. And I've had a pretty hectic but very fun 2011 uh, publishing my book putting together this podcast of course on a regular basis traveling to uh, I think we did three different countries giving live presentations this year and the most recent presentations were in Atlanta Georgia where I met up with a listener who has enjoyed the show my name's Joan and we, you just came up to say hi at the Atlanta Family History Expo, and you said that you listened to the podcast with Steve Luxenberg. What did you think? Yes, I did. I loved him because my book club had uh, read Annie's Ghost recently. Oh. And, in fact, one of our book club members, a very small book club, is a professional genealogist, so it was very interesting to her to give her perspective. And I'm an amateur genealogist, so I loved it. But what was really exciting is that um, I'm from Detroit, Michigan, my, and I'm doing my research in Detroit, Michigan, and I had not heard of Eloise Institution before, okay. but that made me think about a missing great uncle who ended up being in a mental institution, really? <laughs> and I was able to find him because of reading Annie's Ghost. Amazing. It kind of jogged that thought, hmm, right. whatever that happened process. there. Was it difficult? Right. Did you face some of the same challenges Steve did in terms of just getting access to some records? Well, no, because he was listed in the census, okay. and but because it was in, not in Detroit or any town that I had recognized, the mental institution was in Lapeer, Michigan, and I just figured that wasn't the right person oh. until I put together his <laughs> World War One registration which showed that he was uh, incompetent or something that I put that together that he may be in a mental institution. And I thought it was fascinating in the story, in Annie's Ghost, that they moved them so much. So I guess mm-hmm. it's not so much a surprise now to think that maybe he was a little further away than you thought. Right. Yeah, and it's also interesting because I have a second cousin who remembers going with his grandfather to visit this person, didn't even in his adulthood know who this person was, but remember his father, his grandfather taking him when he was seven or eight years old to visit. So now he knows who his grandfather was visiting. Well, how great that your book club enjoyed it. I hope you shared it with them. And I was thinking maybe we should start a Genealogy Gems book club. What do you think? Uh, That could be good, yeah. We could all read it and share. Thank you for stopping by. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And my 2012 calendar is filling up quickly, and I have some live presentations to tell you about for the new year. Now, as I mentioned, I'll be speaking and having a booth at Roots Tech 2012, and in fact, lots of celebrations that weekend, as it is not only my birthday, but also the five-year anniversary of the Genealogy Gems podcast. Can you believe it? I think podcasting itself is only about six and a half years old, so we're not far behind. And I'm very hopeful that I'm going to have some exciting announcements right around that time. So stay tuned. And by the way, Family Search has just announced that uh, they're having the Roots Tech 2012 Developer Challenge Contest. So Roots Tech will reward developers who introduce the most innovative new concepts to family history with a $10,000 cash reward and increased visibility. So if you dabble a bit yourself in high-tech development, I know we have a couple of uh, techie gurus out there, you'll want to visit the Developer Challenge 
page on rootstech.org to find out more about the rules, the prizes, the deadlines. Um, developers who want to enter, you have to register by January 1st of 2012, but actual submissions are not due until January 15th. So uh, I can't wait to see what people come up with. There's a lot of innovative folks out there. Now, after Roots Tech, uh, from there, I'm going to be heading over to London to give a couple of presentations at Who Do You Think You Are Live. I'll be presenting Harness the Power of Google Earth for Your Family History. That's going to be on Friday, February 24th at 11 a.m. And Google Search Strategies for the Family Historian on Saturday, February 25th at 4 p.m. And I am very excited to have been invited to be part of a very special panel discussion on using technology for genealogy as well. So uh, it's going to be a fun trip, a busy one, and I'm very excited because not only is my daughter Vienna going to be coming with me this year, but my friend Janet Havorka of Family Chart Masters is going to be over there as well. She's going to have a booth in the exhibit hall, so it's just going to be old home week over there in London. We're going to have a lot of fun. And then on March 3rd, I'm off to the Utah Genealogical Association Family History Fair. It's going to be in Bountiful, Utah, and I'm putting together a very special Friday night event for that. So uh, those of you who might make it over to Bountiful, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, You can learn more about that at the UGA blog at ugagenealogy.blogspot.com. And then on March 10th, I'm going to be doing a full-day seminar in Phoenix, Arizona, speaking to the Family History Society of Arizona. You can head on over to fhsa.org to visit them online. And in April, I am off to Ohio to speak at the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference in Cleveland, April 12th through the 14th. And you can learn more about that at their website, ogs.org slash conference2012. And April 28th, I'll be giving an all-day seminar at the San Mateo Genealogical Society here in my own neck of the woods, which will be fun. Uh, You can learn more about that at smcgs.org. And then, yes, in May, on May 5th, I'm going to be heading down the coast to San Luis Obispo Genealogical Society to give two presentations. Uh, Lucky me, it's an absolutely gorgeous area down there. You can visit them on the web at slocgs.org. And then May 9th through the 12th, I'm going to be presenting for the first time at the National Genealogical Society Conference, which is being held at the Duke Energy Convention Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. So that should be interesting. And I understand that registration for that is now open. I'll be there not only debuting some brand new presentations, but you'll also find me at my booth in the exhibit hall. So be sure and come by if you make it over to NGS and say hi. Uh, For more information or or to register online, go to ngsgenealogy.org and head over to their conference area. And on June 1st through the 3rd, I'm going to be heading up north to speak to my friends at the Ontario Genealogical Society in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Their conference is called Borders and Bridges, 1812 to 2012. And I just saw that their website is up and running now. It's ogs.on.ca slash conference. And there you can register online and you can get some more information also by emailing them at conference2012 at ogs.on.ca. So, phew, that gets us through, uh, what, the next six months or so. And I hope that one of those locations is near you and that you find a chance to come on by. I always enjoy meeting listeners while I'm on the road. That is fun. And this last item is about our terrific sponsor, Roots Magic. They have just released a brand new version 5 of their incredibly popular software. You know, in genealogy, there are a few ways that I really find myself constantly putting my ancestors into perspective. One is geographically which I'm a big advocate of. And then there's the kind of the linear database look at our family tree that Roots Magic delivers in such a comprehensive way. Um, But I also really need to see the families in the context of time. And so I was really excited to discover that the new version five of Roots Magic now offers us a timeline view. Now we can really put a person's life in context with events from their own life and from the lives of family members. This is why I am so proud that they are a sponsor of this podcast, because Roots Magic just keeps getting better, and they just keep moving forward. But the awesomeness doesn't stop there. 
they have added even more customer requested features. And again, that's another thing that they do so well is listening to their customers. They have added a research manager, which lets you create and track unlimited research logs, uh, the ability to filter the people view, as well as enhancements to multimedia, sources, to-do lists, and much more. There's a little something for everyone in this new version 5. But you got to see it in a live demonstration of these new features to really, really get the full effect. So you can do that. Head over to the Roots Magic webinar page, and you can watch the free class. It's called What's New in Roots Magic 5. It's a great way to take a look at see how this is going to work for you. You'll find it at rootsmagic.com slash webinars. Now, Roots Magic 5 is just $29.95, but I know a lot of you listening out there are current paid users of Roots Magic, and I have some very good news for you. You can upgrade for just $19.95. So do it today. You're going to love it. Head over to rootsmagic.com. Again, if you're just upgrading, it's only $19.95. And the fastest and easiest way to get your copy is to head over to their website at rootsmagic.com. Okay, well, now that we are up to date on the genealogy news, let's hear from you, and we will do that at the mailbox right after this. I want to take this moment to thank our special sponsor for this episode, and that's Audible. If you're not familiar with Audible, Audible is the Internet's leading provider of spoken audio entertainment. They have over 40,000 titles to choose from. If you have a genre that you really like, they have it covered. If you go right now to audiblepodcast.com slash gems, you can get yourself a free audiobook download when you sign up for the service. And if you're wondering which book to get with that free audiobook download, one of my favorites is called At Home. It's by Bill Bryson, who lives in a Victorian parsonage in England. And one day, Bill began to consider how very little he knew about the ordinary things of life as he found it in that comfortable home. In the book, he takes you on a journey through his house, room by room, to, quote, write a history of the world without leaving home. I think you're going to love it. I sure did. At Home is just one of about 40,000 plus audio titles to choose from. So to take advantage of this special offer, get your free audio book by going to audiblepodcast.com slash gems. to me that the podcast is about to celebrate its fifth birthday. And I know that many of you have been listening for almost that long. But it's also so rewarding to know that there are so many folks coming on board all the time, not just to the podcast, but of course, to just discovering the joy of family history. Well, Eric is one genealogy newbie who wrote me recently. He says, I just wanted to let you know that I discovered your podcast two months ago, and have been listening ever since. You take up my daily drives to and from work and even some of the workday. I've made my way through both your family history made easy and the Family Tree Magazine podcast. 
and I've taken a sizable bite out of your Genealogy Gems podcast. I'm still fairly new to genealogy, only getting started after New Year's, and have to say your podcasts have helped a lot and are always entertaining. Thank you, your newest premium member, Eric. And David in Australia is also new to genealogy. He writes, I have just started to work with my own family tree at the age of 50, and I never knew what a rewarding feeling it was to research your own family tree. Thank you for making this kind of information available to everyone. It shows a truly kind nature in a person who wants to share their experiences. And I have found this is the trait of most people I encounter who are into genealogy. You've done a wonderful job and I love it all. Thank you, David. I have started with your Family History Genealogy Made Easy series, which I stumbled upon when looking for some podcasts, and I've subscribed to it. Also, just subscribe to your Facebook page. Yay! I have loved the series that you have in the U.S., and we get the U.K. and Aussie versions here in Australia of Who Do You Think You Are? I'm living this today, and I find myself feeling the same kind of emotion as the people on TV when they find that their great something or other lost a little child or were killed tragically, not to mention some of the men who mistreated the women in the family. If I had a time machine, I would be sorting this out for sure for messing with my family. (laughs) I was adopted out as a baby to a wonderful mom and have only really started to trace my bloodline roots in the last one to two years. To my amazement, I have hooked up with a cousin in New Zealand who's been researching his family tree for many years. And I have now started to use the Gramps genealogy software program. I'm a Linux user, so Gramps is the best and obvious choice. Yes, I am an IT nerd. (laughs) I am now in touch with quite a few of my blood relatives who have welcomed me with open arms and hearts. Sadly, my birth mother passed away of cancer a couple of years before my mom did. So I was destined to be on my own in my late teens, early 20s, just the same. I just wanted mostly to get in touch and say a sincere thank you from a now avid supporter slash fan and pray your genealogy ventures go from strength to strength. Well, thank you so much, David. And it's just wonderful to hear from both you and from Eric. It's exciting to hear people as they kind of get into their first adventure and with their family history and, and to hear how people are already having successes. That's really cool. And Dan in North Carolina wrote in to say that he's also enjoying the show. He says, I've been enjoying your podcast for a while now. This summer, I took on a project to write a book about my father. My father passed away almost 30 years ago. So this was done with memories from myself and other family members. Most of what I wrote about his life was not new to me. But something happened when I got it all written down. It took on a life of its own. It put his life in a whole new light. And I highly recommend everyone write a book about a loved one. I'll have a link to um, David's book in, in a bookstore online, so that you can just kind of see what one person out there is doing. And I think he's probably very right that um, something does happen, I think, when we write these things down. And it's inspiring to see one of our own out there doing just that. So you might want to check that out and get some inspiration. Linda in Sweden um, sent me a message on Facebook about a TV show that started on October 30th in Sweden. In English, it's called Everything for Sweden. She says that the show is 10 from the U.S. with Swedish roots coming to Sweden, competing, and the prize is to meet with their Swedish relatives lost over generations. I'm not sure if you're able to watch the trailer and other clips outside of Sweden on the website, which is in Swedish. And she's provided the uh, URL address. I'll have that for you in the show notes. And the good news is, is that even though the text on the site is Swedish, when I checked it out, I tested the video. You can watch them here in the U.S. They do speak in English. So I will have a link for you in the show notes. You can check out a Swedish family history show that's becoming quite popular. And in fact, um, Lene in Denmark, and I hope I'm at least close to actually how you pronounce your first name, Lene. Um, <laughs> it's L-I-N-E. Um, but please forgive me if I'm not doing a good job of it. Um, she says that she loves the show as well. She writes, I recently stumbled over one of your podcasts, and after listening to just a few episodes, I was hooked. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, She says, I listen to them every day at work, sometimes even twice. Extra benefit, I'm shaping up my English. While waiting for the next episode, I always listen to older episodes. I come from Denmark, and I'm researching the Swedish branch of my family tree. I'm writing to tell you about my favorite TV program at the moment, and it's Swedish. Every Sunday evening, I watch the Swedish genealogy slash game program called Everything for Sweden. 
And uh, she says the participants see the best of Sweden, eat Swedish food, learn Swedish traditions, and learn a bit of the language. They see where some of their ancestors live, and they try to live the way their ancestors did before coming to America. It's fun to watch how all these great people react to coming home, but also very emotional as you get to know a little bit more about them each time. But it's also a game show, and unfortunately, in every episode, one has to go home unfulfilled. We are now at episode three of eight, so I don't know who wins yet. Well, I have to agree with Lene that uh, it seems sort of sad that after all they go through, they only let one of these contestants actually meet with their long lost Swedish relatives. But either way, it's nice to know that family history is enjoying popularity around the world. So thank you, Linda and Lene, for writing in to tell us all about it. And Jennifer in Napa Valley has a tip for us. She says, I'm writing in case that you haven't heard about the new system in place at the Family History Center branch libraries. As of August 23rd, the U.S. West and Northwest have been added to the areas already using the system. You can now place an order for films online instead of having to make a trip to the library just to place an order. Complete information is available by going to FamilySearch.org and clicking on the upper right-hand corner where it says Changes at FamilySearch.org. Scroll down by date to August 23rd and you can get all the complete information. Being a volunteer at my local Family History Center library, I've experienced the changes firsthand. I've used the system as a patron and can report my experience. To place an order, you need to create an online Family Search account, which requires an email address. You then place an order using the file numbers that you want. Payment can be made using either credit card or PayPal. Periodically, you receive email updates which confirm the order, let you know whether it's shipped, backordered, and when it arrives at your library. Like any new system, there are some growing pains. One of the films I attempted to order got hung up, creating error messages asking me to create an account. There also doesn't seem to be an ordering system left in place for someone who doesn't have a home computer or an email address. Responsibility for ordering films has shifted to the patron. While they are encouraged to use the computers in the libraries for ordering, I'm not sure how comfortable people would be about using credit cards on public computers. People routinely use thumb drives in the library and that they've brought with them and may unwittingly be contaminating the computers. I've expressed these concerns to my library director. Hope you find this information useful, Lisa. As ever, I enjoy all the tips you make available. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for writing about the, the new ordering system. You know, when I was at Ritz Tech uh, in February of 2011 this year, I got the opportunity to take a tour of their microfilm fulfillment center in Utah, which is really an incredible facility. <laughs> it's amazing. And I spoke with some of the folks that are involved with that new online ordering system that they were just getting up and running. So it's exciting to see that it's being implemented and actually, it would, I think, I know for me, it would make me more likely to go ahead and pursue some of those films I've been putting off because it always meant an extra trip just to go in and order and then you go home and then you wait a couple of weeks and then you have to go back. Uh, this just cuts out one trip. That's wonderful. So I will have a link in the show notes that it will take you directly to the blog post that Jennifer mentioned called Online Film Ordering System Now Available in Selected Areas that was uh, posted back in August. Well, as always, great to hear from all of you. And uh, coming up next, got another gem for you. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad. And I'll bet he's glad for more than any other a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my hometown.
When you catch the genealogy bug, it's pretty natural to want to share your excitement with other people and to help them learn how to research their family history for themselves so they can experience the same sort of success. Well, genealogy societies are great vehicles for reaching out into the community, but that can be easier said than done. It takes a lot of hard work and volunteers and a desire to make a difference. Well, the Victoria British Columbia Genealogical Society is a shining example of those qualities, and they've found not just one, but several ways to take family history to the young and old alike in their community. I was in Victoria recently, and I had a chance to meet with Merv Scott. He's the project director extraordinaire at the Victoria Genealogical Society, and now you're going to meet him too. And you'll hear how one society is reaching out and making a difference. Here's my conversation with Merv Scott. Well, hi, Merv. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Lisa. You know, I really enjoyed my time up there at the Victoria Genealogical Society. We had such a great time. You guys had a fantastic turnout, and everybody just seemed to be uh, running around, excited and enthusiastic about Google. But I know that they're also enthusiastic about some projects that you've got going on. And I wanted to have you come on the show because so many people who are listening are members of genealogy societies and other organizations, and everybody's looking for a way to reach out and uh, bring more people into the fold, if you will, and get them interested in family history and get them involved. And you have a couple of really cool projects that you've started up in the last year or so that's doing just that. Um, Start off by telling us about your youth program. How are you reaching out to the youth in the Victoria area? Well, thank you, Lisa. And yes, thanks for coming up to Victoria. I've got to tell you, you've left quite the impression. Uh-oh. There's quite the buzz going around in our society, and uh, everybody really enjoyed meeting you. Oh, fantastic. I, so I was quite excited when you asked to uh, interview me for your uh, podcast. You bet. Well, y- you're doing some really neat things there, and, you know, I love the fact that I could just tell that your members were so open to technology and the new ideas that, that I was kind of proposing, and and you've got some that are probably new to your society, but you've really taken the challenge of trying to reach out to the community. Yes, it, it's been so rewarding. I, I, as you know, there's so many wonderful people in this genealogical business that uh, over the years, as I've done my family history years research, I've been helped by so many people. Uh, that I that I really wanted to pay back. So a couple of years ago when I retired, I, I did walk into the library at the Victoria Genealogical Society, and and I found some folks that were so helpful to me that I decided I would uh, contribute some of my time to try and help pay back. So I only joined, oh, two years ago, I guess, and took on the role of project director for the society and uh, tried to uh, determine, first off, how I could... Uh, you know, provide some assistance to them. And uh, it wasn't long before folks were uh, giving me all sorts of suggestions of work that had to be done, and I, I think I'm spending more time now working on these volunteer projects than I was during my working days, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, I can believe it. Well, you know, they can always spot somebody who's got some energy and some ideas. <laughs> you can't hide. <laughs> yeah. But one of the uh, first challenges that was thrown at me was... Uh, to try and figure out how to get genealogy into the classrooms in our schools here in Victoria. I, I, my wife's a teacher. I have a bit of an education background myself and, uh, I knew of some of the problems, uh, that could be and hurdles that could be facing genealogists as we try to uh, teach family history within the classroom setting. So I decided it was important to really uh, sit back and think about this. So, I actually, the way I started was I recruited a uh, a brainstorming committee, if you will. I got some retired teachers together, a couple of youth leaders that were running really fun programs uh, in town. And we got together and, and talked about the pitfalls and the hurdles and how we could move ahead 
and build a successful youth program. And in the end, I, I drafted a very formal report, which I presented to our executive committee of the uh, Victoria Genealogical Society, because it, it held in it certain recommendations that I wanted to make sure they totally endorsed before we move forward. And it had some goals built in and some objectives built in. So it wasn't a project uh, I was taking lightly, and, and it wasn't a project that uh, others on the executive committee could see that I was taking lightly. And I think that really helped, Lisa, by really building a framework to develop the, the youth program. And in the end, uh, uh, the executive committee uh, unanimously supported us, and it was wonderful to move on from there. That's wonderful. And yet you guys really have moved fairly quickly, considering you know how much is involved. Um, what are you doing specifically? How are you getting into the classroom and reaching the kids? Well, one of the things that we realized is being a nonprofit society with uh, no corporate support, no no government support, uh, we were relying entirely on our membership and fundraising efforts to uh, to make these projects move along. And uh, we ruled out certain types of projects right off the bat. And the most important one to rule out was a paper-based uh, project. We we didn't see ourselves producing a lot of paper, producing a lot of binders mailing these out to uh, teachers or spending uh, traveling costs to go and present them at uh, classrooms, etc. So in the end, we decided we had to build something that was more economical, so we, we decided we would build a youth program based on, an, on, an, on the Internet, building a website that complemented our website. Uh, the next step was uh, recruited uh, three retired teachers to help me design uh, what that website would look like and the activities that we would design for uh, would, for students and teachers within that website. And, of course, we recruited a, our wonderful webmaster that made this all happen for us. So it truly is a uh, website that was designed by teachers, and it's targeting teachers. We call it Genealogy in the Classroom. And uh, at our home page, uh, we have this uh, wonderful little uh, uh, graphic of a school with its various rooms and the idea is you click on the different rooms and uh, go to that room in the school that uh, holds the interest that you that you want to study. The teachers designed some very wonderful activities which they've uh, uh, developed into what we call the classroom and, and they are all printable and downloadable. Uh, remember these are teachers that designed these so they wanted to make sure it was easy for teachers to use. Uh, in the teacher's corner, we've got some wonderful teacher's notes, and we also include some teaching alternatives so that teachers uh, can get over the hurdle of of having some students in their class that may not come from your typical family environment. We wanted to make sure that they had understood there was alternative ways to make sure those children felt included, and not only included, but perhaps for the first time felt that they could actually delve into their family history as well and feel good about it. So Teacher's Corner and Classroom were two uh, cornerstones within our new website. Uh, Lisa, you know, there's so many wonderful websites out there that uh, have teaching resources or, or are targeting youth. Uh, we didn't want to try and reinvent, reinvent the wheel. So, we picked and chose some of our favorites and contacted those organizations and asked if we could include them in our online schoolhouse. And they were all so wonderful and, uh, and cooperating and actually a few getting quite excited about what we were building. So we do have some links to some of the uh, uh, programs that other organizations have built. Uh, we felt that uh, piggybacking along with them was a lot better than trying to reinvent the wheel. And that's really smart. It's leveraging those partnerships and people who um, already have expertise and, and items, and and they're all pulling together. Are these Canadian-focused as you're in Canada, or is this something that uh, could be used around the world or in the U.S.? There is a Canadian focus in that the examples used, especially within the classroom, uh, do pull on Victoria uh, examples. For example, I'll give you one example. We have a wonderful lesson called My Story, and in it, it uses story maps as, as a way to uh, brainstorm 
for a child to lay out the story that they would write about themselves. And the examples that are provided are stories that were written by a famous Victorian artist uh, by the name of Emily Carr. Now, this is the way that we've decided to bring some focus to Victoria and to Canada, but that doesn't mean that you can't learn from Emily Carr's ex- stories about her youth and then go on and use the uh, story mapping technique to write your own narrative. So there is some Canadian focus, but it doesn't mean that it excludes people from uh, other parts of the country or other parts of the globe. In fact, one of the first uh, bits of feedback I received when we launched genealogy in the classroom was from a school counselor in New Jersey Hmm. who said, I love it, want to use it, is that okay? And uh, by the way, I see you have a hard copy uh, paper-based booklet that goes along. Would you? I'd like to order those. So that was one of the first uh, school contacts we made was from New Jersey. It's a small globe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But and then yet that helps to kind of fund the entire project. And and tell us about that. That is uh, something that you spearheaded. You're a published author now, right? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm a published author. Yes, we thought it was important to have some paper-based product that we could provide to people that walked into the library or we could provide at events, and we could use it as a fundraiser as well. So I wrote a little uh, uh, booklet. It's a kid's, what I would call an activity booklet. Uh-huh. You can picture the the type of booklet I'm talking about, the cutting, the pasting, the, the drawing. This one, of course, is genealogical-based, so there's the family tree to fill in. But there's also the pasting and the family photos. There's tips on how to interview the family. And, it, and it's actually a, quite a step-by-step guide for what I call the, the detective in your family. So it's gone over really well. It's, it's, uh, it's not a complicated booklet. It's very simple. Um, but I think in the, first, well, in the first four weeks, we sold about 60 copies already. And for our little society, that's, uh, that's fun to uh, you know, have that kind of... Uh, enthusiasm and of course we need the fundraising and being sold at five dollars it seems to be a an easy one for uh, 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 for everyone to swallow i got some great feedback over the web too where people are loading the booklet uh so that's kind of nice that's neat and i love the, the little detective girl that you have on the front cover because that, i'm sure that <laughs> inspires the kids and and yet you've got some really good tasks in here makes them kind of feel like that they're part of the discovery versus uh just sitting down to look at mom's or grandpa's pedigree chart, they're, they're getting involved in doing it themselves. I think that's really the key, is, is kids like to be active. So yeah. this is definitely an activity booklet. And it does link back to our website, Genealogy, Genealogy in the Classroom. Uh, so it, it's almost as a graduation, move on from the booklet and move into the website. And, uh, and the website is can serve quite a range of age of uh, children and young people, uh, but the booklet is a wonderful introduction for them as well. Now, of course, you've been um, contacted by folks as far away as New Jersey and getting involved, and you've been partnered with other groups, and yet uh, a couple of Americans who live in Georgia had a program going, and that kind of reaches from the spectrum of the young to the not as young, but (laughs) certainly the the whys and the people with the stories. Tell us about the Ask Granny program. Yes, it's been a wonderful success here. Uh, I heard about Ask Granny um, through a fellow member at our Victoria Genealogical Society, and I contacted them, and what I learned was they had built materials that they were offering to me free, that I could use in uh, retirement residences in Victoria. And the materials, they provided everything. They had thought of everything. They had laid out speakers' notes. They had laid out ancestor charts that I could use. They had even gone so far as laying out uh, the supplies that I would need in putting on a seminar. So what happened was we struck the... uh, took their materials, made it a little Canadianized because there, a lot of their resources were on, on American sources, genealogy, genealogy sources. And uh, with their cooperation, and actually with their help, uh, we Canadianized the materials and presented our first seminar just in April to a retirement home in, in Victoria. And uh, we did it as a pilot to see what the folks thought of it. And uh, it went over so well that we decided we'd do a few more. 
and uh, I can tell you, I can tell you now, Lisa, that I uh, I'm booked through till May of 2012 to do a monthly seminar in a, a variety of uh, retirement residences in Victoria. It's just an hour long. It's just helping these folks uh, understand how an ancestor chart works. But uh, they seem to enjoy the time talking about their family and understanding the benefit of having a chart. And we leave them with a little gift booklet and the charts as well. And we provide it free. Uh, thanks to an anonymous donor in our society, I've been allowed to you know, buy the materials and provide the booklets and charts to these folks uh, free of charge. So it's a nice thing to do, a little bit of educational outreach to uh, folks in retirement residences, but it's really thanks to the materials that were prepared by uh, my friends in Georgia, the Ask Granny founders. Boy, that's great. So, so you're going in and you're meeting with people who may or may not have even really sat down and thought about their family history, and you're helping them document it. Um, do they do anything in terms of oral history? How how can they continue on after you leave, after your hour? It's really interesting. An hour is very short, but they come in uh, with their ideas, and sometimes they bring in examples of what they've done already, and some have done incredible work on their family trees. But for the most part, they haven't uh, thought of how to organize their thoughts. And that's the beauty of this booklet and this chart that we leave them with, is it allows them to go back to their residences and, and finish the charts off and uh, put it into this folder that we give them. And it's all labeled uh, on the cover as a genealogical gift to my children. So it allows them to talk to us, get some ideas, and then go back home and uh, finish it off so that at some point they can give it to their children. That's really neat. Well, I have to, I have to ask you, Merv, um, again, having been a member of a society for many years, and I know many people listening are involved in some way in their society, what got you past just showing up and attending a meeting and learning something at each meeting and going home? What got you past that into an involvement mode uh, mm. in terms of your society? And are you glad that you have? I mean, sometimes you can get involved and it's hard to, to uninvolve yourself. <laughs> um, how, how's it going for you? you? You've really jumped in there. I, I have really jumped in there. And I, I think it's because I've done a fair amount of family history research on my own family and my roots back in Scotland, and I just received so much help from so many wonderful people. Um, I, I couldn't tell you how many people have gone out of their way to find records for me, to go down to cemeteries and take photographs of headstones for me in Scotland, uh, to go through newspapers in Winnipeg, to you know, just everybody's been so nice. But it, I just saw it as a real chance to, uh, to give back as well. And uh, I'm sure that You've seen the same with the people that you've met in this, this business, uh, that uh, their, their heart is just uh, so big that I couldn't say no, and I, I wanted to help out. It was easy to uh, offer your, your help. It's another thing to actually uh, you know, try to make a difference and try to build something, in this case a youth program, that wouldn't sit on the shelves and collect dust, but would actually uh, be used, and not just now, but in the future. So I wanted to make sure that we were building something uh, worthwhile for them. Yeah, exactly. Something that can continue on, and, and I assume as new people come into the society, getting them involved, do you have any tips for societies who perhaps have a membership of, you know, a group of people in their membership, but are struggling with how to get them involved without overwhelming them? Right. Everybody has different amounts of time that they can afford to use. But I think it's important to give them that chance. Uh, some people uh, uh, may not recognize that uh, by not giving people the chance to volunteer, they're uh, losing the opportunity. So we have lots of functions. We have monthly meetings. We have a library that's open every afternoon of the week for people to come in and visit us. Uh, we go out to events and have a presence within our town. We, it's a population of 300,000 here in Victoria. And every month we're someplace. This past week, of course, was Remembrance Week, and we had a display booth uh, in the local uh, museum. 
with a lot of traffic uh, right across from the major cenotaph within uh, Victoria. So your, your ability to meet new people and talk about family history, we, we've got 345 members and they're certainly growing. Uh, there's been a, a definite uh, increase in the interest here as I think elsewhere. And uh, uh, that's been the fun part is meeting new people and seeing if, uh, you know, what aptitudes and skill sets they have to see if they want to help out as well. Some do. Some don't have the time just yet. But by opening that door, they may have the time in the future. But some uh, people have told me of certain circumstances where the societies, you know, don't open up their doors to the public like that and give the volunteers the chance, or members the, vol- the chance to volunteer. Uh, we make sure that we raise it all the time. If you want to help, if you want to help. And people are always putting up their hands to help. And it's just so wonderful to see. That's terrific. Well, if people would like to see what you have been up to and get involved, perhaps, or maybe tell their local schools about um, your classroom program, uh, tell us again where they can find you on the web and how they can get that information. By all means, yes. And I'd be happy to help anybody if they wanted to email me directly or they can go through and check out our website. Of course, we're the Victoria Genealogical Society and our homepage is at www.victoriags.org. And on that homepage, you'll see a, a, a quick link section which goes to genealogy in the classroom. So please check it out and check out the classroom section where you'll see the uh, lessons that our teachers designed. And if anybody has any questions about it, feel free to email me. My email address is projects at victoriags.org. Projects at victoriags.org. Got it. Right. Okay, I'm writing it down too. And of course you have the, you have the Ask Granny program, which... I think is really neat. Even if every society just did one, you know, reach out per year and helped folks who are perhaps in a retirement center, that type of thing, get involved and have something that they could work on, that could that could uh, really be a wonderful gift to them all year long, something that they can work on and, and get more involved and maybe even get involved in your society. Uh, all terrific ideas. I'm, I'm amazed at your, your energy and your enthusiasm and the fact that you saw it through, I can imagine that a project like this gets can get large and you have your hurdles, but you have really seen it all the way through and it is really coming together. It's, uh, it's, it's exciting to see. Thank you so much for sharing it with all of us here on the podcast. You're more than welcome, Lisa, and it's uh, always a thrill to talk to you. I don't want to leave this without giving you the Ask Granny folks contact information. Oh, yes, please. My friend down there, Judith, would love to hear from anyone that's interested in receiving her free materials through over email. And you could email Judy at ask.granny.us at gmail.com. Great. We will have um, the website addresses that she mentioned and the email addresses also in the show notes for this episode so that everybody will have it right there one click right. away online. Oh, wonderful. All right. Good to talk to you. Hope to see you all of you in Victoria again soon. Oh, I hope so, too. Thanks, Merv. Take take care, Lisa. Isn't it amazing what genealogists can accomplish when they work together and they take action on a good idea? And since that interview was done, the Victoria British Columbia Genealogical Society has been named the Ask Granny Chapter of the Year. Congratulations to Merv and his team at VGS, and thank you so much for offering an example of what societies can accomplish. If you'd like to learn more about the programs that Merv talked about, head over to the show notes and you'll find all the resources.
Morton, author of My Life and Times, a guided journal for collecting your stories. I'm back to talk about writing our own life stories, something every genealogist should do. Today, I'll be sharing three steps to getting those long-forgotten or half-remembered, tangled-up or totally vague memories out of your head and onto paper. Step 1. Write the memories that are on your mind now, no matter what they are. For whatever reason, these are the memories most interesting and available to you right now. Get them down while you're thinking about them. Step 2. Start filling in those daily details about life and relationships from your childhood forward. Use an organized list of questions, like those you'll find in life story writing journals, like my new book, My Life and Times. These questions jog your memory about specific things that it probably knows but just isn't volunteering. Things like how your parents disciplined you, how you performed at school, what you learned and what you earned at your first real job. Step three, look to see where the gaps are. If you're using a life story journal like My Life and Times, this will be easy because your recollections will be in order. Where you find holes in your stories, use these memory jogging exercises. Look through old photos, yearbooks, letters, papers, jewelry, and other memorabilia. See what memories they spark. Listen to songs from the time period in question. Travel back to the place something happened. Walk through your old neighborhood or stop at the courthouse where you were married. If you're too far away, visit a nearby neighborhood or courthouse that may help recreate the setting in your mind. Finally, get together with an old buddy, classmate, or coach and reminisce together. Now, some of your memories, especially about your childhood, will be fragmentary or vague. You may recall your dad's voice saying he was leaving your mom, but not your mom's reaction, or even your own. You may only remember 10th grade as the year you finally figured out how to wear your hair. You may remember song lyrics or the smell of mothballs and cigarettes at grandpa's house. These are all valuable memories, even if they are incomplete. Write them down. They'll fit into the larger story as you collect more material. In the end, you won't remember every detail. Who does? But the process of remembering is like a snowball rolling down a hill that gathers more snow as it goes. You'll likely be surprised at how much you remember once you get started. Next week, I'll talk about borrowing other people's memories to add to your own. Until then, this is Sunny McClellan Morton, personal and family history expert, author of My Life in Times, a guided journal for collecting your stories. I help others save their lives one story at a time. Check out my blog at www.yourlifeinfiveminutes.com or learn more about me at www.sunnymorton.com. Thanks so much for listening to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 123. If you want to drop me a line, you can do so at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com or leave a voicemail on the voicemail line 925-272-4021. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.